want to talk today about um, XML as a tool for developing what current uh, IT thinking refers to as uh, domain-specific languages. Uh, we're going to, I want to talk a little bit about the, the basic problem area out of which the idea of domain-specific languages has come, uh, and talk a little bit about what what the term denotes today, uh, and then talk about the concept of generalized markup, uh, or uh, and I will refer indifferently to generalized markup, descriptive markup, SGML, and XML. Uh, you may have um, been told or gained the impression by looking at some of the rhetoric that uh, there's a huge gulf between XML and SGML. Uh, when we were first putting XML out, uh, we did our best to uh, distinguish it, to distance it in people's minds from SGML, because a lot of people had looked at SGML and said, gosh, that's way too complicated, we can't bother with that. And we wanted them to take another look. So we did not, uh, the name XML intentionally, as a result of uh, a careful consideration, uh, does not include any reference to SGML. This succeeded in persuading people who had written off SGML as hopelessly irrelevant to their needs that they had to take a look at this new thing. And many of them decided, oh, SGML was terrible, but XML, that's very different, and we're going to use that. Um, this, of course, demonstrates that they didn't understand SGML at all, because there's no uh, essential difference between SGML and XML in anything that matters. XML differs from SGML only in some, uh, uh, per, uh, yeah, uh, in some edge cases and some uh, uh, minor points of syntax. It's a lot simpler to parse. It's a lot simpler for software to work with, and uh, that's a that's a big difference. But from the point of view of almost anything we're going to talk about today they're essentially the same. Uh, so if I switch randomly among those, uh, it's because I regard them as synonymous for all essential purposes. Uh, then I'm going to show you a simple example and uh, examine how various XML-based domain-specific languages make that example possible and talk a little bit about uh, what issues may arise when you roll your own domain-specific language. So, um, I don't know if you, if you read the IT literature, you will uh, rapidly get the impression that many, many, many IT projects fail. Certainly the IT literature is full of people worrying about the high rate of failure of IT projects. Frankly, I have no idea whether IT projects fail more frequently than other kinds of projects in this world, but uh, the IT uh, thinkers and writers are are um, obsessed with trying to figure out why so many IT projects fail. Many, many IT projects do in fact fail in the sense that uh, some company or organization invests a large amount of money to develop some software and then it doesn't do what they wanted it to do and they end up essentially writing off the cost of their investment. And um, an article by Ghosh published uh, recently in the Communications Association for Computing Machinery, explains it this way, it is common knowledge, he says, that most projects that fail do so because they lack a proper communication structure between the users and the implementers. The difference in terminology used by the various stakeholders of the project hinders meaningful communication. Uh, in other words, on Ghosh's analysis, the typical reason for IT projects to fail is essentially that the programmers didn't understand what they were supposed to be doing because they didn't understand what the users were asking. And even if they successfully implemented everything that was listed in their requirements document, the project is still likely to be a failure because the requirements document is wrong. Uh, of course, quite frequently in failed projects, there wasn't a requirements document first place, and that's also part of the problem. 
requirements documents are one of the many techniques that people have tried to suggest as ways to, uh, to bridge this gap between the people who actually need the software and are planning to use it and the people who are supposed to be building it. Uh, there actually are several approaches to, uh, to solving this problem, dating back uh, as long as the 1950s and the development of COBOL, the common business-oriented language, which uh, is frequently derided today as having an unbearably verbose syntax and slightly eccentric uh, syntax because it doesn't read like uh, algebraic equations. It reads like English. Why does it read like English? It reads like English. It says, for example, instead of x equals y plus z, it says add y to z giving x. It reads like English because part of one of the design goals of COBOL was to make it possible for the managers of the programmers who had a clear idea of the business case to read and understand the program. Now, history has shown that that was a fond hope, which like many fond hopes, has remained unrealized over uh, the course of time. But note that goal. The goal is to make the program comprehensible to the customer. A uh, more recent approach, not entirely and not in exactly the same vein, but uh, it's similar in, in some effects, is uh, called literate programming. People don't laugh at literate programming largely because uh, literate programming is the invention of Donald Knuth, who is widely regarded in the information technology industry as, um, as God. Um, and justly so, he's, he's an extremely brilliant man. And uh, if he says an idea is good, if you don't think it's good, uh, your problem is not so much to show that it's not good as to figure out why your evaluation is incorrect. Because the chances, uh, if you disagree with Snooze, the chances that you're right and he's wrong uh, are small enough that you can really uh, usefully just neglect them. Uh, the problem with all of these uh, uh, approaches, however, is, um, gosh, uh, my slide has, has malfunctioned, um, uh, is summed up in, an old, in a motto that uh, I remember seeing on a coffee mug years ago. Uh, if you make it possible to write programs in English, you will discover that most programmers cannot write English. Um, so there are other attempts um, uh, trying to bridge the gap from the other side. If you can't make the product of the programmers easier for the end users, to understand. Try to make it possible for them to do it on their own. And again, first, exam first uh, efforts in this direction can be traced as far back as the 1950s, the development of Fortran, uh, whose name comes from formula translation. One of the big innovations of Fortran is precisely that its notation is a lot like the algebraic notation used by physicists and other natural scientists whose problems the Fortran development team was trying to help them solve. The idea essentially was to make it easier for scientists to write their own computer programs. Uh, to a certain extent, that has succeeded. Although in my experience, what happens is that um, anyone who's actually important enough to have a budget uh, that to support uh, software development has graduate students. And uh, it is the graduate students who write the Fortran and not the, uh, not the practicing physicists. Uh, once you have tenure, uh, what, one of the things that means in physics is you never have to write Fortran again, apparently. Um, the result from the IT point of view, of course, is that many natural science programs are abysmally written. Uh, they are uh, they're horribly inefficient and from a programming point of view, uh, it may just be horrible, partly because they're all written by amateurs, they're all written by physics graduate students who would really rather be doing physics. Um, so not a complete success. Um, macro languages in all sorts of applications and other tools for power users are, in a sense, an attempt to make it as possible or at least more possible 
for users, people actually trying to get work done to solve their own problems without having to communicate with programmers. Spreadsheets are probably the single greatest example of a success in this area. Once accountants saw spreadsheets in software form, uh, they essentially said, I must have that. And uh, many people are, no, are, are not aware that the term spreadsheet once referred to a genre of exercise that was performed exclusively on paper uh, with calculations performed by hand. Um, so you will find in the earliest discussions of spreadsheet software terms like electronic spreadsheets, which seem very weird to us, redundant to us today. What other kinds of spreadsheets are there? Well, they used to be on paper uh, for the same reason that uh, early discussions of electronic computers now seem unusual. What other kinds of computers were there? Well, as it happens, as any historical lexicographer will tell you, computer used to be uh, a noun that selected for an animate uh, entity. Uh, humans were computers. The uh, computer was the name, was the job description of someone who spent their time doing arithmetic calculations. And there are important figures in the history of mathematics whose signal skill as a mathematician was their proficiency in calculation. And there were important mathematical advances in the 19th century that were assisted by you had a sort of uh, someone who we would regard today as the real mathematician of the project taught uh, enlisting the aid of someone who was better at um, actual arithmetic calculation. But as uh, a man named Lynn Bullard once said, more or less, it doesn't matter what your job description is or what your degree was in if you can write a for loop Behind your back, they refer to you as the programmer. <laughs> so all of these tools, when they succeed, um, may have a tendency to produce a situation in which um, the person who uses them becomes more and more of a programmer and thus and less of a domain specialist. Um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, he said, uh, speaking as someone who uh, follow that path. <coughs> but my advisor uh, strongly urged me never to get involved with computers because he said philologists who spend start working with computers end up spending more of their time with computers than on philology. And I always think he must look at my subsequent career and point to me when he talks to his graduate students and say, see, I warned him. I warned him and you see what happened. He hasn't published an article in Old Norse in 30 years. <laughs> there are other attempts to solve this problem. Um, the disciplines referred to now as uh, extreme programming or agile programming, agile development, are all an attempt to deal with this problem of uh, software projects going their own way, not, in fact, by improving the communication particularly, so much as just limiting the potential costs, making quick prototypes and making very short revision schedules so that before you have spent very much money, you have software that users can look at and say, no, that's not quite right, lest you spend another six months going further down that, that uh, path. Um, and you get the customers involved in choosing which of the following 10 features are most important to implement next and so forth. That works sometime, uh, but it's, um, I don't think it's a solution, or it's not a full solution. In any case, it's not regarded as uh, yet universally adopted as a solution. And so we have proposals for things like domain-specific languages. Uh, in a sense, domain-specific languages are just a practical application of the Sabre Report hypothesis. Uh, everyone remember what the Sabre Report hypothesis is? It is the hypothesis that the language you speak shapes your thinking shapes the way you see the world. Um, and in a way, it's, it's just an application to the brain and language of the general sense that tools shape the hands that use them. And mental tools shape the minds that use them, and language is a mental tool. So if the language that we use to talk about 
an area affects the way we think about the area, what does that tell us? It should tell us that ideally we want a language that makes it easier to think about the domain area, the domain in the way that we want to. And if you look at a typical programming language, C, Pascal, C++, Lisp, Perl, Python, and you say, what does that tell me about linguistic analysis? The answer is not very much. And if you try to describe linguistic analysis or literary analysis or almost any, uh, anything that a humanist is interested in doing with a text, in terms of a general purpose programming language, you spend all of your time dealing with concepts that are nowhere close to the concepts that you want to be thinking with. This is true not just for linguists and literary scholars and historians of philosophy. It turns out also to be true of options traders and brokers and bankers. They turn out not to want to think about for loops and memory allocation either. And of course, they have more money than most humanists. So, so most of the examples of domain-specific languages are languages for options trading and stuff like that. Um, the basic idea of a domain-specific language is that you should create a language for talking about the domain of application, the domain to which, for which you want to develop some software. And as recently described in the article by Ghost that I, I have already quoted once, it's a four-step process. In collaboration with the users, you derive the common vocabulary of the domain. There's a sort of anthropological flavor here. You are supposed to learn the vocabulary from the people who are going to use the program. You learn the vocabulary, and then you build the domain model. That's your, of course, notice also that this article is addressed to the IT person. You, the IT person, build the domain model using that common vocabulary. And because you're using a vocabulary you have learned from the users in the domain, the goal is they will be able to understand it, and they will be able to tell you whether it's right or wrong. And then again, in collaboration with the users, you develop a syntax for talking about, for using those words, and then you develop the business rules that determine how things happen. And the ideal case is in some cases, the actual domain users may participate in that development. That's the real seal of success for a domain-specific language, is that specialists in the domain can use the language without feeling that they're making a huge uh, effort to learn programming. Conventionally, domain-specific languages are uh, classified into internal, that is embedded in some existing programming language, and external means independent, so they have to be implemented standalone. Uh, both of these classes typically have completely operational semantics. We'll come back to that and its significance in a moment. Uh, so some uh, commonly cited examples of domain-specific languages, uh, the, the statistics language R, which has already been mentioned today, and S, um, specialized for the domain of statistical calculations, of course. Verilog and VHSIC, specialized for the design of integrated chips. Who knew that chip designers needed a language of their own? But they too don't want to think in the terms offered by most programming languages. They want to think about transistors. Again, not for those. Uh, Mathematica and Maxima, which for some reason seems to have changed its spelling at some point along its life. Uh, Maple, other languages aimed at, again, an echo of the original goal of Fortran, aimed at allowing mathematicians to write down what they want to do in the notation that they're used to using, in a mathematical notation. Uh, GraphViz is sometimes cited. It's a tool for drawing graphs in the mathematical sense. That is, bubbles and arcs, nodes and edges, and so forth. And sometimes cited is HTML, which may surprise you a little bit. But think about what writing hypertext was like before HTML. Writing hypertext essentially meant writing programs in some language that was designed to make it easy to write hypertext. Only most of them didn't make it very easy to write hypertext. 
uh, HTML as a specialized language that allows you to say more or less directly what you want. Uh, make this bold, uh, make this a paragraph, and not how to go about doing it is in a way a perfect example of a domain specific language. Um, and it's not a surprise. Why? Because HTML is one of the first widely known applications of HTML and descriptive markup. Now, as work on, in descriptive markup is practiced by some of, the, uh, some of the best people in the field, it follows a workflow that's, that's very similar to the one we just saw described as the way you build a domain-specific language. The first step in any major uh, HTML or XML project, at least as these, uh, these people practice, is document analysis. You must understand the area, the, the set of documents to which you hope to apply descriptive markup. You need to identify the information components, that is, the things that you need to be able to point to, to talk about, or to act upon. You need to define them so that, the, uh, so that you can consistently identify them. You will end up in a well-run project with scope notes and all sorts of things that look at, like the annotations to the Anglo-American cataloging rules that you will find in the cataloging department of any university library. The local, the local rules, the clarifications, all of those things apply here. Why? Because they're solving very similar problems. There's a, a variety of phenomena in the real world. We need to register them in some consistent way. Whenever you have a difficult case, write down how you did it. So the next time you have that difficult case, you can do it in the same way. Once you've identified these components, you describe the relationships among components, moving up to more and more complex uh, structures. You describe the properties of the components and the constraints on them. And once you have this more or less static description of the way information can be structured, then you worry about customizing editors so that it's possible to create documents using this markup in write style sheets so that you can, you can display documents and write transformations so that you can transform the documents. Does this sound familiar? It should sound familiar because it's exactly analogous to the development of descriptive uh, domain specific languages as described by Gauche. So if you take descriptive markup seriously as a framework for developing domain specific languages, what does it get you? Well, first of all, it gets you, gives you a standard syntactic framework. Things are marked up using tags. There's a start tag and an end tag, and what's between them is the thing that they're identifying. And the tags themselves are, de are delimited with an angle bracket at each end, and so forth. So if you use XML to develop a domain-specific language, there are a whole class of questions about how I should write, how you should write it down, write down instances of your, in your domain that never come up because XML provides answers for those. XML gives you a relatively rich structure. Essentially, you get, at one level, a set of ordered trees with attributes on the nodes, uh, at another level, you can have pointers from one node to the other, so you can actually represent arbitrary graphs, not just trees. This is not always fully appreciated. Um, and you have, because XML is easier to implement than SGML, you have for XML, uh, more than for SGML, you have a software ecosystem. You have a lot of uh, libraries that can read XML for any programming language you care to, to use, including, by the way, COBOL. And Fortran, um, and you have programming languages like XQuery or XSLT, which are essentially designed for processing XML, where XML is built into the data model at a very deep level. Uh, you have no semantics. This was one of the most frequent criticisms of SGML and XML at the outset, and I continue to believe that it is one of their greatest strengths. Why? Because the refusal of the SGML and XML specs to define any fundamental semantics for 
and the markup languages you define using them means that when you define the language, you get to specify the semantics however you like. The semantics of an application of XML or HTML are limited only by human ingenuity. There are no rules. You can do essentially anything you like. This is why I'm giving this talk about XML and descriptive markup as a possible framework for generating domain-specific languages, and I'm not giving it about tech or TROF or Word as a basis for domain-specific languages. Why? Because tech does define semantics, as does TROF. Their semantics are a document is bits of ink on paper, and they can be very subtle in their description of the patterns ink makes on paper, but they're really very poor at describing the relationship uh, of subject-verb agreement or any other linguistic property or theological property or philosophical property or anything that would be typically of interest to a humanist interested in the thought conveyed by a text rather than its physical character. And even those who are interested in the physical transmission of texts will typically be happier, I submit, uh, using XML to define the properties of books that they care about than using Word or Tech or TROF to replicate those properties. Because the semantics of descriptive markup are declarative, and it's much easier to reason about things and uh, about them than they are in, in systems like Tech or TROF, whose semantics are purely imperative. And uh, I won't go into the details of why. You can just take it from me. Uh, reasoning about imperative languages is possible, but it's really, really hard, and um, most people don't do it. So we can now revise the classification of domain-specific languages. There are internal languages and external languages, both with operational semantics. And there are other domain-specific languages that do not have an operational semantics, that have a purely declarative semantics. They do not say, this means do x. They say things like, this means this is an x. And what you do with that, now that you know it is an x, is possibly context dependent. Now, it's worth noting that HTML descriptive markup was first developed not by computer scientists and not by philosophers or literary scholars or linguists. It was developed by people in the printing industry and people in the technical documentation branch. Why? Because they knew perfectly well that they were investing huge sums of money in making digital forms of technical manuals. And they knew that with the next release of this operating system, we're going to need to issue this technical manual again. Only we're going to give it a different style. And to the extent that the style of presentation is baked into the electronic representation, we're going to have to keep with the whole damn thing again. They knew as a practical matter, because they were in the business of producing printed documents, that the exact form of the printed document is, in a philosophical sense, an accident of the document and not part of its essence. It is a peripheral property and not a central property. They wanted an electronic representation that would stay current. And they solved that problem by making it possible to create electronic representations of documents that said about the document only those things which would remain true even after we release the next operating system and we use 12-point uh, instead of 11-point type and we have a wider margin on the left. That's not the way tech works or word processes work or TROF works. Uh, and so they needed to invent 
a new way of working. And what they invented, they called descriptive markup because they said, well, the whole point is you're describing what's there. The reason you're describing what's there is they want to capture only the things that aren't going to change. And of course, being involved in document production, they were perfectly aware that the styling of the document is terribly important. It's not a value judgment. It's a permanence judgment. And it is not the case that they said, oh, you should have no control over what it looks like. You should exercise the control. The idea of descriptive markup is you should exercise that control from another location in a style sheet. Why? Because we want to replace the style sheets even at times when we don't want to replace the content. Um, so let's look at a simple example. Uh, some of you will have seen will know this poem, will have seen it uh, as an undergraduate. Uh, if you haven't read it, um, I'll give you a moment to, to look at it. It's a very pretty poem. Uh, it's, uh, it's not exactly a love poem, but, it's, uh, but um, it's certainly an erotic poem. Um, now, this is uh, an edition, the transcription of an, a modern edition of this poem. They flee from me that sometime did me seek with naked foot stalking. Uh, as edited by uh, Ian Lancashire in a collection called uh, Representative Poetry Online. But if you look at a different modern edition, this is uh, an edition prepared by Kenneth Muir for Rutledge, King, and Paul, uh, you see a very different spelling because Muir preserved the 16th century spelling of Wyatt and uh, Lancashire has ruthlessly modernized. Uh, and well, mostly I think he's done a fairly good job, but, uh, but I hate the way he punctuated the text. So, uh, so, I, so I prefer yours, uh, yours version. But yours is also a 20th century scholar. And uh, what yours reading is in some sense a 20th century version of this poem. This poem became famous in English not in this form, but in the form published in Toddles Miscellany. And uh, you're going to, to understand the significance of this, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to look. Uh, look at the um, first, yeah, the second and third line. With naked foot stalking in my chamber, I have seen them gentle, tame, and meek that now are wild, and do not remember that sometimes they put themselves in danger, etc. Um, if you look at the version published in Tottles Miscellany, an important collection of uh, uh, early Elizabethan or pre Elizabethan verse, uh, you see that Tottle has routinely normalized the rhythm. He has suppressed the, uh, the trailing E's uh, that were Wyatt's uh, heritage from Middle English, perhaps. Uh, so we clearly are assuming a modern English pronunciation. And that makes Wyatt's meter feel too rough for Tottle. And as part of the increasing regularization of verse, Tottle normalizes all the meter. Now, for 20th and 21st century ears, this is a much less interesting poem. Uh, Wyatt is much, is much more fun to read than this because this is so regular and uh, uh, such, a, such a, a trotting meter. Uh, if you want, however, uh, we should also look just should look at Wyatt's manuscript, or this is not an autograph, but it's a uh, contemporary manuscript, and uh, as reconstructed from the apparatus of Muir's edition. And it's, uh, well, you have to be used to Elizabethan spelling, perhaps, but uh, uh, you can see that the 20th century editions follow Wyatt against Tuttle. This is the, one of the reasons I, I love this poem, one of the reasons I first got interested in it was uh, that this is used as an example of the historical development of meter. Wyatt writes this way. By the time Tuttle's miscellany is published, people don't write that way anymore, and Tuttle edits. Um, now, on the other hand, it's really cumbersome to have to look 
back and forth from one version of this poem to the other. So the whole point of this example is um, I want to be able to look at the manuscript D and have an apparatus criticus in the right margin. Okay. Um, now, if I if I had spent a little more time with the stuff sheet, I would have made this appear at the bottom of the of the window, but um, it was easier to make it appear in the right margin. So, if you're used to reading critical editions, this will be uh, relatively straightforward to read. Uh, if you're not used to reading it, you may have to puzzle over it, and you might prefer to look at the apparatus in a slightly different form. There's uh, so we can use a form that the Germans called Zeilensynoptik, uh, which I've never found a decent English translation for. Um, so uh, essentially, you just print them all under each other, and you highlight the words that change. So we sort of grayed out the words that do not change, and uh, left the words that, that do vary. And now you can see uh, the variations in spelling and the uh, can see Tottle's rhythmic changes and so forth. Now, the whole point of this is that uh, whole point. one of the points of this exercise is that I do not have four transcriptions of the document. These are all being developed, generated from the same XML. And that is easy in large part because XML lends itself to the creation of specialized vocabularies. Um, so let's look first at a simple transcription. This is a transcription of one of the one of the, the witnesses. And you can see that instead of talking about, oh, make a new line, make a line break here, or uh, indent, uh, make a blank line, we just say, this is a line group. And within the line group, this is a line. Um, actually, I'm showing you these angle brackets in XML. I'm sort of assuming that you all understand. Uh, anyone here want a little, uh, does anyone need uh, a little uh, uh, a five second introduction to XML? OK. Uh, you really, those of you, those of you who don't need it, it won't take very long. Essentially, the one basic rule of, of XML is the parser is stupid, and the programmer writing the parser is lazy. So you must make everything easy for the parser. And the easiest way to make things easy for the parser is that everything must be explicitly delimited. Every boundary should be marked explicitly. The boundary of this line, busily seeking with a continual change, marked at the beginning with a start tag says, this is the beginning of an L, L4 line. Marked at the end with an end tag. Slash L means this is the end of an L. The tags themselves, marked at the beginning with an angle bracket, or an angle bracket slash, marked at the end with a close angle bracket. That's all the syntax that we have here. Uh, one other rule, these form a tree. So the L's nest within an LG. You can't have an L start in one LG and end in another. <coughs> if you want to do that, um, you will feel slightly uncomfortable in, uh, in SGML and XML. On the other hand, if you want a line to begin in one line group and end in another line group, we need to talk about your, your uh, notion of verse structure because uh, where I come from, if you begin a line in one line and end it in one line group and end it in another one, you have made a typo. And, um, there is a there is a problem. Okay, so the, you can see the basic idea of domain specific languages here. XML does not define something that means verse line. We did. In this particular case, this is the markup of the text encoding initiative and the TEI did. Why? Because the TEI was developing a vocabulary for the tagging, among other things, of historical literary works. And so, and first being an important part, 
there are tags for lines and line groups. There are no tags for lines and line groups in HTML, because HTML was originally developed for the tagging of routine documents and physics papers, and they don't have much verse. <laughs> One of the reasons that commercial interests got interested in XML was that routine physics papers also don't have things like product, uh, um, catalog numbers, product numbers, and prices. Uh, and if you're putting a catalog on the web, it would be nice if uh, the user interface could actually identify the price. And uh, XML does make that possible. Okay, so we have first structure. That's not very complicated. Uh, text critical structure is a little more complicated. Uh, and there, it's even more useful to me as a, as a person writing the uh, application to be able to define my own vocabulary. So what you see here, beginning in this, after the blank line, is a line containing, among other things, something tagged as an app, which stands for an entry in the apparatus criticus. Um, and you can see that I began life as a medievalist, and I think of textual variations as things that get entered into the apparatus criticus. So app seems a perfectly natural word to me. Uh, if it doesn't seem quite so natural to you, um, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you get to roll, you get to design your own if you want to. You don't have to use the TEI. <coughs> Many intelligent people have lived happy lives. Uh, never using the TDI. Uh, within an apparatus, an, an entry in the apparatus criticus, what do we have? We have multiple readings. And that's it. What, and each reading is witnessed by one or more manuscripts or other witnesses to the text. Uh, and that's a bit of syntax we haven't seen before. You see angle bracket RDG for reading, and then WIT equals, and then a quoted string with uh, symbols. That means the witnesses to this reading are uh, MD and L, read I have, and witness T, that's total, means uh, once have to read, once have I. And that opposition, one reading against the other, is the way this domain specific language conceptualizes the notion of textual variation. It is opposition of one set of words against another. Now, because we're dealing with 16th century poetry. There's an awful lot of variation that is purely random spelling variation. So the markup here distinguishes substantive variations, that is, vari vari variations in which the different readings have different words and purely orthographic variation, where they have, in this case, the opposition of chamber, spelled R-E, and chamber, spelled E-R. They have different spellings of what is, at some level, the same word. Now, there's a judgment call here, but uh, what is literary criticism and textual criticism about, if not the exercise of judgment? So I have no hesitation in telling you those are the same word and different spellings. Um, and I say that because I know enough of this in English to be able to, to make that judgment. Uh, when I could try to work in languages I don't speak, I can't make that judgment quite so well. Uh, but that's part of what humanistic training is about, is to train you to make those judgments. OK, so the data are in this form using a domain-specific language that uh, was developed, in fact, for this kind of thing by scholars at, uh, at great effort. Um, but that's not the only domain-specific language at issue here. When we display, wrong window, when we display this, well, you notice nothing in the, uh, nothing in the document we were looking at tells you to make it to make the first line red and the others uh, uh, alternatively gray or black. How does that work? Well, there's another domain-specific language at work here. If I can get the right 
document. The NexSLT style sheet, and I won't explain to you anything about the way XSLT works, except to show you the obvious, which is that XSLT, as a language for manipulating XML documents, conceptually offers you things called templates. And you write them, oddly enough, by writing start and end tags for templates. And templates can match things, and you specify by writing what it matches in an attribute value. And XSL can generate elements, which you can generate in this way. There are other ways to do it as well, but this is the way I tend to use. This generates an element named style. And already we're on the verge of an, of an operational semantics. When this is evaluated, a style element will be in the output. And you can think of this as a normal programming language, or almost normal programming language. It's kind of unusual and difficult for some conventional programmers to get their heads around. But uh, you can see what kinds of things exist in the world of XSLT just by looking at the kinds of things it allows you to write. This is the practical application of the Sacred Horf hypothesis. XSLT is probably the single most successful XML application in the world. Um, yeah, bar none. Um, I was about to say, with possible exception of HTML, but HTML, of course, is an HTML application, not an XML application. And the XML form of HTML, XHTML, is probably not quite as successful or widely used as XSLT. So this is another one. There's a third language involved here, because, of course, Somebody has to know, some agent has to know that when I go to that URL, the style sheet I showed you should be applied to the XML document I showed you, and the result should be sent to your browser. Who tells the server that? Well, I tell the server that, and I tell the server that using yet another domain-specific language named like the sitemap language for Cocoon. Again, I'm not, this is not a Cocoon uh, lesson, so I'm not going to tell you very much about this. Just to say the obvious, the configuration language for Cocoon allows me to specify a bunch of pipelines through which data will flow. And this pipeline says when the user gives you the URL that ends with the empty string, the first part has been stripped off by the time we hit this location, then do the following. First, read the file called yamp.xml. Second, under certain circumstances, apply a particular, transform it by applying a particular style sheet. And then finally, I won't show you off the bottom of the screen, there's an instruction to send it to the user as HTML. Again, a domain-specific language, um, you don't have to have an XML language to configure uh, a server. If you have ever worked with the configuration of Apache, uh, the Apache server, for example, you know perfectly well that most Apache configuration files are not XML. Uh, this, on the other hand, is one reason I prefer to work with this system and not with Apache, because with this system, I know how to write a comment in a reliable way, and I know how to edit the document usefully, and I know how to avoid making uh, uh, idiotic syntax errors. Because software under, that understands the vocabulary can help me avoid all of those problems. When I write Apache configuration files, there's a parser, but the parser is nowhere, in, nowhere around when I'm editing the document. And my editor doesn't have built-in knowledge of Apache <laughs> configuration files. So I cannot touch an Apache configuration file three times without making two syntax errors. Whereas I've almost never made an error here because there is a syntax definition that allows perfectly general purpose editors, in this case Emacs, to understand the syntax and prevent gross syntax errors. It doesn't prevent semantic errors. I sometimes write a pipeline that doesn't do what I want because I've seen, I've 
provided a syntactic the correct description of the wrong process. But by eliminating a large class of syntax errors, why? Because the syntax is standardized, XML in this particular domain-specific language allows me to avoid a large class of errors. So, those are uh, the TEI, XSLT, the pipeline language. Those are simple examples of uh, domain-specific languages written on the basis of XML or using XML. There are some others that you may have heard of, the Scalable Vector Graphics Language, or SVG, which allows you uh, to specify using XML um, arbitrary drawings. And since they're defined in terms of vector graphics, they scale very well, they, they, they work beautifully in your, in your browser. And because it's XML, it's easy to generate with a machine. And so it's extremely easy to read an XML document, perform and, and perform some calculations on it, count words, uh, uh, do whatever you like, and draw a picture, a visualization of some property of the input, for example, a bar chart, uh, using SVG. So because SVG uses XML and XSLT easily produces XML, it's easy to chain, thing, chain them together. Uh, the Corpus Query Language, CQL, and its successor, XXL, uh, both developed at the University of Oxford for Corpus Queries, again, exploit the XML infrastructure uh, to, to, uh, to define, in this case, a query language for searching language corpora, uh, specifically, originally developed for the British National Corpus. Um, so you can have very when you're looking at 100 million word corpus, uh, you really want to have fairly specific queries, otherwise you're going to be swamped in the, just the sheer volume of the number of hits you get. <coughs> so your structures are going to have a certain, your queries are going to have a certain structure, and CQL and XSL make that, uh, make that visible. Uh, .ml, which is an XML version of the dot language, which is used to drive graphics. Uh, not actually supported, not actually written by the people who wrote graphics. It's written by somebody else who got tired of making syntax errors in uh, writing his graphics input and uh, wrote XML instead. Uh, and I have converted to it and have, again, uh, avoided a lot of problems ever since. Uh, Xforms, which allows you to define user interfaces within certain limits, of course. Again, the safer work hypothesis. It allows you to define interfaces of the kind that it allows you to define. Uh, and there are some limits there. Uh, but if what you want is the kind of thing it can express, it makes it much easier to define them. And of course, any document description language of the kind for which HTML and XML were originally developed, docbook, HTML, the encoded archival description for finding aids and so forth, those are all uh, forms of uh, domain-specific languages. So, if you do this, what advantages do you get? Well, most obviously, as an implementer, you don't have to write a parser for the damn thing. Now, this is not necessarily an unalloyed blessing because many IT people get a lot get a, get a kick out of writing parsers. Uh, I personally enjoy writing parsers a lot, and uh, I feel kind of guilty about uh, taking that joy away from others and myself by by promoting XML the way I do. But uh, uh, inventing a new syntax so that you have to, can write a new parser for it uh, is not really the most effective use of IT brain power in the world. Um, so I don't feel too guilty about it. Uh, you get consistent syntax rules, which is maybe good for you as a developer if you happen to like XML syntax rules. Uh, it's particularly good, however, for your users. I don't know uh, how many of you have uh, written Unix configuration files for X and Bash and uh, network software and so forth. Uh, I spent a lot of time doing that uh, 15, 20 years ago and it drove me crazy because no two programs use the same parser with the configuration language 
So I never knew how to write even something as simple as a comment. Often a hash mark running to the end of the line I, I would work, but sometimes it was a semicolon, sometimes three semicolons in a row, um, because programmers uh, exercise their ingenuity. And it would have been fine if I'd spent all day writing only one kind of configuration file, but I didn't. And uh, so from the point of view of someone who has to use a lot of these, bearing in mind that one of the advertised dangers of domain-specific languages is you end up with a bunch of a lot of different languages, and, and uh, uh, the user gets confused uh, because they all have different rules. If they're all based on XML, you don't have quite that danger. You still have a lot of different languages, and that may or may not be a good idea. But you do have consistent syntax rules, and therefore a certain amount of transfer of training uh, for your users. But crucially, when you work on the basis of descriptive markup, you have more or less automatically, unless you work hard to overcome it, you have the opportunity for a clean distinction between declarative semantics, statements about what things are, and imperative semantics, statements about how to, what should be done. And um, as is well known, declarative semantics typically has the advantage over imperative semantics. First, that it is easier to reason about, but also that it is more flexible. Uh, as the great uh, computer scientist John McCarthy said in his Turing lecture, an instruction to make uh, uh, the knowledge of the fact that when something falls down it may make a noise can be used in a variety of ways. It can be used to make a noise. Oh, I want to make a noise. I'll make something fall down. It can be used to avoid making noise. Oh, I don't want to make a noise, so I must not make anything fall down. It can be used to infer that something has happened because you perceived a noise or you did not perceive a noise. Whereas the, an imperative statement to make a noise can only be used in one of those ways. So de the upshot essentially is that declarative encoding of our knowledge is almost always going to be more cost effective because you get more value for the effort. Surely any list of advantages uh, should be followed by a list of disadvantages. Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, Sometimes uh, programmers, especially conventional programmers, programmers trained in imperative languages, uh, have a really hard time getting their head around uh, the value of declarative encodes. Um, partly because, of course, skill uh, at conventional programming languages consists largely in thinking imperatively and procedurally. And um, so those programmers have been selected for that skill. Uh, and uh, having to think in a different way not only is a, a, not necessarily a skill that they have been selected for, but it also <coughs> can, particularly when you have uh, 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 biased people like me saying, talking about the advantages of declarative, uh, declarative semantics, uh, it can cast ever so slight a shadow on the value of their skill. And this can be difficult to, to accept. Um, so if you deal with conventional programmers, be prepared. If you are a conventional programmer, just relax. There is a gestalt switch, which will happen if you stare at it long enough. Um, also, uh, another problem that conventional programmers typically face is uh, that common programming languages uh, tend to deal very well with simple XML. As I said, there are libraries for XML for almost any language you like. However, the languages themselves are still the languages that they are, and their notion of the way information gets structured is still pretty much frozen in 1965. Uh, and they're really typically not very good at dealing with, even with things as complicated as trees, let alone graphs, let alone trees that are not regularly structured but are irregularly structured the way human language documents tend to be structured. Uh, so 
Um, well, my advice if you um, if you're going to implement a domain-specific language in XML is uh, to work with a programming language that, that does it that does well with uh, with them, and that means uh, XQuery and XMT. Uh, so, if you do this for you, if you if you do this at home, I'm not going to tell you not to. I mean, in fact, I'm going to tell you yes, you should. You should think hard about rolling your own languages. There are very smart people who say no, no, no. No normal person should ever write their own XML vocabulary because you should just use the standard off-the-shelf vocabulary. Uh, this is fine uh, for certain people. Um, but if you are trying to make a tool to help you think the way you want to think and to help everyone in your project think in the same conceptual terms, an off-the-shelf language is not necessarily what you want, unless it is exactly what you want. Either way, you have to think about what's going to exist in this logical universe you're, you're designing. What internal structure do those things have? How do they relate to each other? What operations do I want to perform upon them, and how do we compose those to the, the simplest level of things to build more complicated things up? Uh, be careful along the way to separate the things that you will still care about next year from the things that you need now but may not need in the same way next year. Uh, typically, if it's a verb today, it's still going to be a verb next year. But if it, the fact that it should be printed in bold today doesn't typically mean that it's should be printed in both next year. You may want to restyle your website. This is not necessarily easy because it means you have to think hard. You have, what is, the name that philosophers give to that first question is ontology. And people have, have spent lives worrying about ontological questions. And you have to answer them. And if you're going to build a system, you have to answer them uh, before the grant has expired. <laughs> and that can be hard. Uh, also, it's hard because no one is going to give you the answer. And that is why I say that XML has uh, an ancestor in uh, Immanuel Kant. Um, some of you will be familiar with his essay, uh, answer to the question, what is enlightenment? Aufklärung ist der Ausgang des Menschen aus seiner selbstverschuldeten Unmündigkeit. Unmündigkeit ist das Unvermögen, sich seines Verstandes ohne Leitung eines anderen zu bedienen. When you let a software vendor provide your conceptual framework, you don't have to worry about what exists and what's important and what's not important. They do that for you. But if you want to take control, you need to take responsibility. And that means not relying on what someone in or in Utah or Redmond, Washington or elsewhere has thought you should think is important, you need to decide for yourself. That's the real reason to use domain-specific languages, and that's the real reason to use the script department. Thank you very much. Could you repeat the question? I can try. Uh, 
surely my list of disadvantages was disingenuous and too short. Uh, surely there are domains uh, where some other well-defined model would be suitable, for example, the relational model, or where some of the conceptual baggage of uh, HTML and XML, in particular the emphasis on trees, uh, will make for a, a, a bad fit. Is that a fair fair phrase, Ben? Um, yeah, that's true. Uh, it's true at least within limits. There are certainly uh, uh, situations in which um, a relational database is a great tool. And uh, I have no objection to using relational databases. Um, if I want to exchange, if I want to move data from one relational database to another, uh, my experience, well, my experience is actually fairly limited. I have, I've only done that a few times in my life. And I've been perfectly happy with common limited form. Uh, so I was actually surprised when database companies started showing up in XML working groups. And at one point, I took one of, one of the guys aside and I said, uh, OK, explain to me, why are you doing this? You guys don't have any of these problems. You, you know, you, it's easy to dump data from one relational database and move it to another one. And he said, really? Will you talk to our users and tell them that? They don't say that. Uh, because it turns out common delimited form is simple enough that no one uh, bothers to define it formally. And uh, complicated enough that no two programmers who implement it from scratch will come up with exactly the same rules. So it's not too bad if you dump the data from one IBM database and load it into another database from IBM, because there's some possibility that it was the same programmer that wrote the dump routine and the load routine, or at least that they talked to each other. But if you dump it, in a, from a database from one vendor and loaded to another. It's not my experience, but the experience reported to me by people from Oracle and IBM and Microsoft, um, they're interested in XML because XML does provide rules for those piddling little trivial details that programmers can't be bothered to worry too much about because it's obvious that you want to do it this way, except when it's obvious to somebody else that you want to do it the other way. Uh, so, um, even in even in the case where my metal model fits nicely into a bunch of rectangles, uh, which does happen, but not as often as I once thought it was it was going to, uh, I made one XML for the for the transport, and XML is in fact perfectly capable of representing relational data. It's just that. If you represent purely rectangular data in XML, there are going to be XML syntax, uh, XML structures that you don't end up using very much. Um, I was a real fire-breathing uh, advocate of the relational model when I first learned about it. Uh, and then, as an exercise, I went back and I took the design of the bibliographic database, which was my first big project with computers, and I translated my design notes um, you know, and the, the field structure that I had developed, and I reduced that into third normal form, or I started to reduce it to third normal form. When I hit uh, 20 odd different tables, uh, and realized every time I return a bibliographic item, I am going to be doing a 20-fold join. At that point, I stopped. I, I never finished the third normal form uh, because the strengths of a relational model, which, which were, you know, oh, you can, you can retrieve any of these things and you can use them in unexpected ways, uh, had no relevance to that particular application. This is a bibliography. The one thing I am going to want to retrieve in the real user interface is a set of bibliographic items. And bibliographic items, at least 
as I was structuring them, bearing in mind that I was coming from the MLA style sheet tradition and not the library tradition. So every translation and every edition of each translation was part of the same item. It was describing the intellectual content and not the physical item. Um, they turned out to be trees. So, so professional <laughs> databases are good where they work. Um, and they can express all sorts of information. There's no information so complicated that they can, it cannot have an expression in the relational model. For practical reasons, however, quite often I don't want to use that. Um, Non-tree stuff, uh, in some ways, similar. Even if I want a model that involves arbitrary graphs or trees with overlapping structure and so forth. I may well want XML as the interface because, remember, there are no limits on the semantics of XML. The XML structure may have to be a tree, but the information structure it describes does not have to be a tree. So yeah, probably a little disingenuous. structure of line groups and lines is, is a perfectly important structure there. Uh, it's visual type, it, it's, it's re reified in the typography. But part of the pleasure of poetry is that you have another structure working against it. You have the phrase structure, you have rhythmic structures, you have uh, enjambement and, uh, and uh, alternating with in-stop lines and so forth. And how do you, if you have, so essentially you have another parallel structure at least one other parallel structure, and maybe more than one. How do you handle that in XML? Uh, there's a, there is a long history of, of efforts to address that question, uh, going back to the developers of SGML, uh, who built into SGML a feature that was dropped in XML that allowed specifically four concurrent hierarchies, <coughs> multiple hierarchies over the same uh, frontier of uh, character data. Um, and conceptually, that's one of the simplest ways, is just to say, well, we're going to have two trees. Now, in an XML document, um, how do you do that? There are. There are a number of, of, of ways. I, I think I'll say there are two families of approaches. One approach is to say, uh, move one or more of the trees out. So I've got, and quite, typically, quite often, have uh, move almost all of them out. In any, uh, in any modern language corpus, for example, we'll typically have a transcription that has uh, word by word word-by-word -word segmentation of the text and identifiers on all the words. And if you have a phrase structure markup or uh, uh, document structure markup, that will be stand that will be standoff markup held in another document or elsewhere in the same document, sort of 
instead of marking the beginning and end of a line by having a start tag and an end tag in the data stream, it will be an L element over here pointing, saying it start, this L element starts there and it ends there. And now I've got three XML documents, one that's relatively flat, that just has the words, one that has the line group and line structure pointing into that in such a way that at any point I can say, well, supply the text and let me process that as if it were a normal XML document. And another one pointing at the same words with, say, the linguistic structure or the anaphore structure <laughs> or, for transcription to spoken text, the intonation structure and then the utterance. So you've got utterance structure, you've got intonation, you've got the discourse analysis, the discourse structure, and in, a, in, in some modern linguistic projects you'll end up with uh, uh, six or ten levels, uh, ki different kinds of analysis, each with their own internal structure, pointing at the same base data. And the usual method in, uh, among linguists is to have this use standoff Mongo. <laughs> the other family of approaches essentially says, well, let's, let's go back uh, to something that was textual. Let's take, um, let's make a vocabulary where we repurpose some, some, uh, some parts of the syntax. Uh, and quite often you'll have an empty element whose meaning is, this is the beginning of something. And then you'll have another MPL that says, this is the end of something, uh, or, or other mechanisms. Essentially, uh, the simple, naive, and most common uh, mapping from an XML structure to the conceptual structure is each element becomes an object in the conceptual structure, and the relations among the elements become relations in the conceptual structure. And this second family essentially says, we have a slightly more complicated relation. Some elements become individual things, and others become you know, signal that something has to be gathered up and become a, a conceptual structure, a conceptual object. Or uh, they other they complicate that mapping from the XML document structure to the conceptual structure in some way. I don't want to go into details because it's. Um, Let's make it up. This. Yeah. Okay. Well. <laughs> Um, there will be opportunities to continue these discussions and initiate new ones at our reception. But I'd like to um, first thank the sort of the very